that's not a comic book. Now that's a comic book. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Comic Reviews. I hope all is going well. I hope everyone's having a good time today. Uh, just getting some stuff readjusted, and before I start, I have some announcements to go over. Uh, if you really want to, timestamps in the description. If you're watching this after the fact, to skip ahead, but please, announcements aren't important. Uh, so, very first thing, Comic Book Club, the voting video for that is still up for what we'll be talking about on the next episode of Comic Book Club. So, please, please, please go check that out. Uh, vote if you haven't. If you don't know what Comic Book Club is, it is an open invite live show where anyone who has a legal copy of the book we're talking about, uh, whether they got it from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, local comic shop, Comixology, um, rented it from your local library, whatever you got to do. Uh, if you have a legal copy of the book, a microphone and headphones and a webcam is a preferred method, you can join in the discussion and we'll be talking about uh, whatever it is, is chosen. And that's why there's a voting video up. There's four options to choose from. Four Marvel books. Black Panther, Who is the Black Panther? Thor, God of Thunder, The God Butcher. Uh, Punisher, Max, Kingpin. And X-Men Evolution Volume 1, which is based on the old uh, WB show. So anyway, that's, that's up. That's a voting video. And I hope you'll take the time and vote. The voting closes this Saturday. Speaking of this Saturday, uh, the Monthly Comic Roundup show is broadcasting this Saturday at 1 p.m. Vac and I just uh, worked it out together and, and got down a time. So please join us for that. Uh, again, that'll be Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time live, of course. So hope to see you there as we go over our top books from each week of May. And it's going to be a big week, and it's going to be a big episode because May had five weeks in it. One, two, three, four, five. Five Wednesdays, let me put it that way. Um, and free comic book day. So it'll be six books to go over, plus we'll talk about the worst book of the month, the best cover of the month, and some uh, other comic book related news. So hope to see you there. Hope everyone uh, arrives and has a good time. All right, other announcement stuff. Do I have anything else? Oh, yes, Trade Talk. And I'll talk about this again later in the show when I start doing Trade Talk. Uh, I'm changing up the formatting uh, or the scheduling of the channel just a little bit. Not a lot, just a little bit. Um, thank you, phone, for telling me that I am live. Uh, anyway, I'm changing up the format of how videos are posted just a little bit, uh, so let me break down the schedule for you, starting with Sunday. Sunday on this channel, we'll still be posting the regular episode of Geeky Gentlemen, the hour to hour and a half long discussion or review, whatever the given topic is every week. Uh, Monday is when Trade Talk will now be posted. And I'll get to why that's changing in just a minute. So Mondays or Sunday regular episode, Monday trade talk, Tuesday geeky gentlemen character discussions, Wednesday new comic reviews is staying the same, Thursday geeky gentlemen fan film reviews, Friday is geeky gentlemen clip day. Now, if you've been following the channel for a while, you've noticed that I usually tend to post a clip from our main episode on Monday is kind of like a marketing thing. And that's that's been going for a while. I've been doing that for a couple of years now. And I'd only ever done it for the main episode when we started up the fan film and character discussion videos. It just didn't feel natural and I didn't want to flood people's feeds. Uh, so I just never posted clips from those. Um, but they've become such a regular part of the, the channel now that it, it feels a little silly not to, but I still don't want to flood anybody's feed. So Friday, you're getting clips from all three episodes in one video. And I think that'll be nice because maybe you saw the video and you're like, I don't know if that really interests me, but now you can listen to a clip from it along with the other clips. And maybe that'll change your mind. You'll go back. Or maybe you missed a video. You didn't realize it was out that day or something. And now you'll see it and, and have a chance to go back to it. So... That's the idea behind that. So that'll be on Friday. Saturdays, 
are uh, variable still. Those will those will change just depending on what's going on. I'm trying to do more more daily content on the channel, but Saturdays where like my monthly stuff kind of falls in. So like comic book club, new uh, monthly comic roundup, stuff like that. So there's the schedule. Um, but to make all that work, I had to move something. It made sense to me to post the clip after all the episodes of Geeky Gentlemen were up. So that made the most sense to post on Fridays. Uh, and also, I've had a hard time getting episodes of Trade Talk edited in time to post on Friday afternoon. So just a little little bit of rearranging. That's my thought process behind it. Um, I'm sure most of you won't even notice. That's okay. I, I will love you regardless. Anyway, all that stuff out of the way. Let's go ahead and get into what we'll be discussing this week. All right. Star Wars Lando Double or Nothing, number one. Green Lantern's Annual, number one. Daredevil, number 603. The Man of Steel, number one. Brian Michael Bendis is here. Uh, Super Sons, Dino Mutt, and the Blue Falcon, number one. And Batman, Prelude to the Wedding, part one, Robin vs. Ra's al Ghul. Alright, so there's the uh, weekly issues, and then we'll, for a trade talk, we'll go over to Venom and Carnage by, uh, who is this guy again? It's here, written by Peter Milligan with art by Clayton Crane. Uh, so, promise more Marvel and, and to go a little outside of the box. Uh, I've been doing a lot of DC lately and I want to want to spread my wings a little bit. Uh, but seriously, look at these. Look at the monthly books. Oh, I also fucked up. Uh, also, we'll be talking about uh, Invasion from Planet WrestleTopia number two. So, look forward to that as well. Okay. Um... But yeah, for like a, a fifth Wednesday, fifth Wednesdays usually suck in a month. Usually you'll get like one book that comes out. They piled on here, and the funny thing is, only one book was on my, or only two books this week were on my poll. Uh, anyway, let's go ahead and talk Star Wars Lando Double or Nothing, number one. And guys, I gotta, I gotta do it. I just... You're going to be disappointed in me. Here's my Ian Harrington nerd card. Rip some of it off. I haven't seen uh, Solo yet. I just I just haven't... Uh, like, there's a couple reasons for it. I'm not super into Han Solo as a character. Or I just... I don't know. For whatever reason, I just haven't gotten out to see Solo yet. So, um... Yeah. Uh, I, I haven't seen Solo, but I bought the Lando tie-in comic. Because I just am more interested in the Lando movie. Uh, but anyway, so this is a Lando Tyne comic. Um, I I believe it's supposed to be set before Solo, uh, though I don't know how that movie ends, so who knows. Anyway, I like Lando quite a bit. I loved his miniseries that we got, uh, what was that, 2015, 2016? Um, that was a great, great little miniseries, and here he goes again with his own, with another miniseries for him, and, uh, for a first issue, it starts out pretty okay, I was, I was pretty happy with it, uh, Lando's, Lando's really in character for me, he's suave, he's kind of, like, quirky, kind of funny, um, he really feels like, uh... I don't know, he feels like the kind of guy who you would totally never trust because you know he's going to rip you off. But then when he rips you off, you, you're not that mad about it because he's such a cool dude. I don't know. It's, it's a weird feeling. But yeah, Lando just gets it for me. Um, I, I, I love this scene in the beginning because it gives you a really good sense of his character where he's talking about how he can deck out the Millennium Falcon and make it look even better. And... His droid, L3, tells him, you don't need all that stuff. What we need to focus on is the weapons and defensive systems. And he's like, no, listen, I live a very dangerous life. And in order to balance out that stress, I need pr 
prime, primo living conditions. I'm like, ah, that's so perfect. I totally buy that for Lando. Um, and then there's a lot of bickering, and, and Lando gets contracted to smuggle um, weapons to a, an enslaved planet that's been, of course, enslaved by the Empire. And he's not interested in doing it uh, until they just tell him how much they're willing to pay him. Um, and he gets, you know, crosses paths with the Empire and has to fight him off and yada, 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 yada. Uh, anyway, so it gets crazy. He, uh, and before they even have time to breathe, they're already at the planet. So it's time to, time to start up on everything. And like, he's, he had to shoot down the TIE fighters. So like, ah, I'm aware that you all may feel a little funny about the praise you want to heap on me. But don't fight the feeling. <laughs> uh, it's like, and they're like, hey, we're here. What's that? We're approaching Kolorgar. Can a guy get a minute to celebrate himself? I like that. It's fun. It's It's got a pace to it. It's written in a way that I like to read Lando. It's It feels very in character to, to my estimation of the character, at least. I'm going to be like a Lando expert over here. Um but yeah, this was this was a solid story. Uh, I was I was pretty happy with that. Uh, also, really like the art. Um, it's it's doing the thing I feel where they're trying a little too hard to make him or to make the the art look like the actor. But it really helps that Donald Glover's the only name character or like actual character in here. I mean, I know L three is of course in the movie, but um, L3 being a droid, it's a little easier for, for the artist to get away with that, uh, if he is doing any kind of reference. So, Lando and just a lot of these panels, like, that doesn't look, like, traced directly off the screen or anything. This, maybe, that looks a lot, like, if it's not traced, it's de it's heavily referenced kind of thing, right? Um, which, in and of itself, is not a problem, it's just been a, a trend I've noticed with some of the Star Wars comics to just like pull directly off the screen and that gets a bit distracting after a while if you're you know familiar with star wars as a film franchise and i mean well i'm not gonna try to gatekeep and say oh only real fans buy the comics or any shit like that i'm like Who, who's all buying the comics that's not going to be able to recognize images from the films you know you know what i mean uh all right. Anyway, so yeah, uh, solid issue, fun, enjoyable. I'll be putting the series on my poll. <laughs> Five issue series, so four to go. All right, let's go ahead and, and move on to Green Lantern's annual number one. Uh, now, if you watch the show regularly, you know I don't I don't read Green Lanterns monthly. So why the hell am I buying the annual? I'm a big Green Lantern fan. I really do like Green Lantern. I haven't been keeping up with it monthly. Uh, I had a, a bit of harsh feelings after Jeff Johns ended his run on kind of an iffy note at best for me. Uh, and I got really inspired at one point to start picking up the series monthly, but I wanted to catch up on the trades that I'd missed. And then that kind of got away from me and I, I kind of fell off again. So it's all on me it's all my fault it's no comment on who's writing it now i have no opinion on the regular writers right now uh anyway so green lantern's annual number one uh though i i was excited to pick up because usually annuals tend to be standalones particularly when they're written by people who are not part of the regular ongoing team and i believe that andy diggle is not the ongoing writer for green lanterns um if i'm remembering correctly it's tomasi or hmm, i should probably look that up i should probably know that but i i was certain when i looked at him like i don't think that's that's the ongoing writer um so definitely gave me a lot more inspiration to pick it up uh and just okay it's probably going to be a standalone story that's not really affected by the run. And hey, it's a standalone story that's not really affected by the run. Yay. Uh, I should also say, this is like the first major story I've ever read with Jessica Cruz. 
Uh, I've read her here and there. She's popped up a couple times, but more to just deliver a line or something. She's never had much character presence, and here she's the main character of this story. And that was great. It's a standalone Green Lantern story. It's in space, thankfully. Um, so this is, this is already working for me on a lot of levels. Uh, one of my problems with Green Lantern uh, has been that it's, it's not really accessible because there are, everything's building on top of itself constantly. And that's all well and good if you're super into that stuff. Um, but it's, it's a little annoying when you can't say, when someone says, all right, I want to get into Green Lantern. What should I read? We'll start with this 70 issue run. And then, you know, it's, it's annoying, but here, not the case. Uh, nice, solid, standalone, complete story just in, I don't know, what is that, 40 pages? Um, and that's, oh, that is so refreshing in this day and age. So the story is that uh, the Green Lantern Corps is gathering um, on this, the remnants of a planet for what is called the Ceremony of the Lost Lantern. And it's a, a destroyed planet that uh, was consumed by its sun going supernova. Um, and all that really exists about it is the, the legend that the Green Lantern that was defending the planet died trying to save it. Or something to that effect. Um, no one really knows. The, the history has kind of faded away. And multiple Green Lanterns have to speak at this, this ceremony, including Jessica and Simon. Uh, Jessica Cruz, of course, suffers from extreme anxiety and so I, I love this that the thought of dealing with with space disasters or alien tyrants is a cakewalk to her compared to the thought of public speaking i adore that that is super awesome and interesting and i'm I immediately love Jessica Cruz as a character for that. I've heard a lot of people um, that suffer from mental illness and, and anxiety problems talk about how they really, really relate to Jessica and, and find her very identifiable. I can totally see why. Um, to me, it becomes very endearing. It, it makes her a lot more human in that, that way. Um, so it's, it's really cool. What's going on over here? Sorry. <sighs> YouTube's dumb. Anyway, uh, so yeah, that was that was a really cool thing. So they're supposed to speak, but she keeps getting told by the Green Lantern of the sector and of the survivors of the planet um, that everything she's doing and she's got planned is inappropriate and defies custom and yada, 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 yada. Uh, and so then it comes time to give the speech and Simon goes... And he tells a story uh, that he relates to and, and tries to use it as a way to um, to bridge the gap, the, the cultural divide, as it were. Uh, but he's told that his story is inappropriate, and he's like, ah, well, I, I did my thing. Um, and then Jessica's got to go, and now she's just completely overwhelmed because her prepared speech has now been called inappropriate because it depends too much on cultural metaphors from Earth. Uh, so she has to throw that out and speak from the heart, and she tries to give a speech and just keeps tripping over her words and, and can't do it and fumbles the whole thing. In order to vent from this, she goes to the other side of the planet to just try to collect her thoughts and, and you know, get some, some rage out by, you know, punching rocks and all that jazz. But this triggers... An event and some Green Lantern construct tentacles come and grab her uh, and completely overpower her as she uh, tries to, you know, defend herself. Uh, and its willpower reading comes in at 255%. Uh, she's like, her willpower, 96%. That thing's willpower, 255% in Jessica's reaction. That's not even math! I like that. Uh, that's oh, that's good stuff. So anyway, she's being abducted by this Green Lantern somewhere, but she tries to tell, no, I'm a Green Lantern, I'm a Green Lantern. And it's like, species not recognized conclusion is that you're an imposter. Uh, so she's locked away, um, but she realizes that fighting the thing isn't helping her because it's just completely overpowering her. 
So she um, decides to give up the fight and, and let it be taken so that she can maybe, you know, talk or something. Uh, Simon, John, and Hal uh, figure out that she's gone missing and go to try to help. Uh, they too get captured by the tentacles and completely uh, just decimated. Uh, they all, they give it their all, fighting back against the tentacles. Um, and the tentacles enhance countermeasures. Willpower at 1,487%. Uh, so it's just, whew! Anyway. Uh... So Jessica, in her little makeshift construct cell, has to come up with a plan, and she remembers the time that her phone, uh, that she bricked her phone when trying to update the IS, or the OS. It's Star Trek, folks. It's so fucking Star Trek, and I love it. That is, oh, it's perfect sci-fi writing. Um, any time, like, to, to quote Futurama, Anytime something complicated happened on Star Trek, they'd explain it with a metaphor that makes perfect sense. Oh, okay. Well, like if we overload his molecules, he'll explode. Like a balloon with too much air. Perfectly. Alright, we're overloading his molecules. He's not exploding. In fact, he's getting more powerful. Like a balloon when something bad happens. <laughs> oh, yes. Perfect perfect kind of uh situation so yeah jessica's thinking through her situation noticing that the the ring the the ring that has captured her didn't recognize her but she's on a planet that hasn't had life in millions of years so she realizes that she thinks about when she tried to update the os on her phone but because her phone was so old it couldn't handle the new os and it became just a brick um and so now she's talking to her ring she's like i've got a plan I need you to downgrade yourself to be a less advanced version akin to some of the early versions of the Green Lantern rings. And I love the- her rings got such sass to it, it's awesome. I did not know that about the, the character and it's making me love her even more. Um, so like she, she tells the ring, so let's downgrade you and the ring goes, I hate to break this to you, Jessica, but I'm an advanced neural interface designed by hyperintelligent interdimensional beings to generate willpower-based hard light constructs in defense of all sentient life. Not a phone! <laughs> oh, man. This is... Ah, oh, that's so perfect. Yeah, but you can, can you run Candy or Crush? This is the worst plan ever. And I just... I love her look! Oh, she's got such... Oh, that's like... That's why she's a Green Lantern right there. I remember hearing people complain about Jessica Cruz becoming a Green Lantern since she suffers from anxiety. And it's like, well, why would the ring pick her? That's exactly fucking it! That's why! <laughs> like, that is the exact fucking reason. It's so perfect. Like, she's got the, the will. She's got the concentration. She's clever enough. She's got everything that it needs to be a lantern. She also suffers from anxiety. It's not a... It's not a, a flaw, it's not a disqualifier. The core embraces diversity, and that means diversity of mental states. Anxiety and fear are not the same thing. Uh, it's important. I love it! Ah, it's so good! So anyways, yeah, so she updates the OS on... <laughs> or downgrades the OS on her ring so it can interact with the... Uh, constructs um and she's able to find this lost lantern who has put himself and indeed thousands of members of his race into stasis for eons um and his because his willpower is that absolute that it's it's survived for millennia um and it's put him in this state to access that level of willpower he's constantly reliving his life um he's constantly reliving the events of his life that led to this decision um and so it's it's self-sustaining will in that way so she 
enters this holographic interface that he's reliving, sees his past, and sees that his world leaders um, made him uh, serve them. Otherwise, they would outcast him as a Green Lantern, Green Lantern, and in order to not betray his race, or uh, he ended up betraying the core, suppressing dissent amongst his people, people that were uh, crying out for freedom and representative representative government and stuff. Um, so he detained them for millennia, but it ended up saving them from a supernova. And Jessica was able to talk to him and get him out. There is a brief trial in which he is sentenced to millennia, uh, a million years in a construct incarcerated facility. Uh, and that's, that's then commuted because given the extenuous circumstances, uh, he's being... Um, He's being given retroactive time served. Uh, and Jessica and Simon are assigned to him to help him reintegrate to the modern universe. Ugh. That is so good. Oh, that is so good. I love this story. This is like the perfect kind of blend of what Green Lantern is to me. Um, this is the ideal version of how you tell a Green Lantern story. Um, what you want is you want the the epic, because Green Lantern does does two things that are really important. In the, the spectrum of sci-fi, you have the extreme epic, the, the really fucking cool, the space opera, and the biggest media to go to for that is Star Wars. And then you have really introspective sci-fi that says something about ourselves, says something about the human experience, the human condition. And the big thing to go for with that is Star Trek. And Green Lantern provides this perfect bridged gap between them, where you can have a story that is super epic and super big, or you can have a story that is super introspective and super interesting, or you can have both at the same time. And Green Lantern can do that. So you've got this thing of an entire race being saved from a supernova all on the strength of one Green Lantern. And you've got this other thing of this incredibly human story about suffering from anxiety, about not knowing what to do in a certain situation, and about having to deal with what you're given and not hold yourself to too high a standard for it. Love it. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Fantastic issue of of Green Lantern. Um, instantly made me love Jessica Cruz. Again, I hadn't read anything, not because like I hate her or Simon or anything like that. I just I fell off Green Lantern uh, monthly. Fantastic issue, though. <laughs> All right. What am I doing here? That's... Okay, cool. What's going on in the live comments? Um... All right, Man of Steel. Yes, I am talking about Man of Steel today, folks. Don't worry. Uh, it's still kind of salty on Bendis for what he did to Iron Man. I don't know what Bendis did to Iron Man. World's Finest is here. Hey, man. Jessica Cruz should be the main Justice League Green Lantern, kind of in the same role as Kyle in the JLA. I could see that. Uh, yes, I did pick up Man of Steel. Are Lantern Rings self-aware? Depends. Uh, Jessica Cruz's seems to be. It's a highly advanced intelligence, uh, AI, if nothing else. Uh, there was a good Green Lantern's moment in Doomsday Clock today. Oh, damn it! <laughs> I really thought about picking that up all on the strength of that amazing Joker cover, but I just didn't. Um, being, having a strong will is not the same as being free of fear. Yes. However, I really don't know what is the difference from anxiety and fear. I mean, it's it's complicated to explain, and I really don't feel like getting into it just in this video, but I, I, I don't know. Um, 
I'd, I'd have to get into it in its own video or something like that. Ask me again at a later date. We'll see if I can get into that. All right. Let's go ahead and talk about Daredevil, number 603. Uh, so I was talking to Steve Baxi at one point, and Steve told me that he loves Daredevil, but no matter what, without fail, every great Daredevil arc eventually turns into a plot by the hand, or it involves the hand in a major way that can't get away from what's going on and that's exactly what's happening <laughs> like when ninja started attacking the city i was like oh okay i mean it's a it's a cool way to get matt in the in the mayor's office then and then he just goes out and fights ninjas and gets with electra and now there's a demon and and uh, I mean, I just don't care. I was so into like the the duplicitous politics and the the dealing with Wilson Fisk's you know corrupt administration and all this stuff. I was so there for all of that, and then it's like fucking ninjas and shit. And I'm like, eh. Can we just not do the ninja part? Like, can we just use the ninjas and then get rid of them? I don't know, it's certainly not bad or anything. I'm certainly still enjoying it to some level. I just don't care about ninjas or the hand or Electra. Like, the whole opening of this book is just Matt fighting ninjas with Electra for a minute and then asking her to stay and help the city. And then Matt goes back and actually does his job as mayor, which, again, I promise you, is much more interesting than anything he can be doing as Daredevil right now. Um... And then they they get to the Temple of the Beast, and I don't know anything about this guy. I assume he's got some connection to Blind Spot or whatever. Uh, and he releases the fear that the city's been feeling since the ninja attack started. Uh, and it's kind of like a, a giant cloud of gas that, that seems to be choking people. Uh, and then... Matt smells it before anyone else does and collapses and apparently he needs a hospital and then some guy shows up who can clear the smoke uh, and claims he's Matt Murdock's uh, past, or, uh, minister. No, priest. priest. Um, I don't know anything about this guy. I, I'm, I'm not a big Marvel guy. I'm damn sure not a Daredevil guy. My name is Father Jordan. Is that, like, secretly a villain or something that I didn't know about? Um, okay, Manuel Cabez uh, is here to save the day. Most of the hand things happened to be set up many previous arcs ago, okay? And the Beast is the spiritual leader of the hand. Good to know. Good to know that information that I don't care about. Ugh. <laughs> uh. Okay, and World's Finest is saying that he's a Daredevil guy and he has never heard of Father... Uh, what was it? Father Jordan. Uh, does it help that he's, like, in a gas mask with, like, armor on and stuff? Um... <laughs> eh. I don't know. Uh... Even the art's not really doing it for me as much as it was in the, the previous issues now, because I'm just less invested in the story, unfortunately. So, like, even the, the cool ninja fighting, I'm just like, I just don't care about the ninjas. I don't want to see cool ninja fighting. Um, eh. Just eh. Just a whole lot of eh. Uh, ABC123. ABC. Uh, says that... Uh, Father Jordan came earlier in Soul's Run. Uh, and Robert Emmett says that if he ever wrote uh, Daredevil Run, he would have a running gag about Matt fighting the hand in between arcs and then people asking what was the deal with the ninjas and Matt responding, it's not important. Uh, that's fair. <laughs> That'd be fun. 
Uh, the priest happens to be the guy Matt confessed his identity only to get off his chest and how his secret and now his secret identity is back. Uh, okay, now we know. And that's a dramatic turn. Again, I'm, I'm not interested in Daredevil's secret identity unless it's affecting the mayoral, mayoral stuff. Which maybe it will a little bit, but still. Uh, I'm, I'm not interested in the hand unless it's directly connected to the mayoral stuff. And, I don't know. I just so, I just so want to see Matt Murdock be the mayor of New York. That's so much more interesting to me. Uh. Alright. Moment everyone's been waiting for. Let's do it to it. Man of Steel, number one. Bendis is here, baby. Bendis is here. And how is it? It is, um, it's okay. Nah, it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Uh, I, I did enjoy this. I don't think it was quite worth the hype. Like, it's, I, I've seen a lot of people, like, raving about it and saying it's a great story, and I, I was certainly interested. I certainly liked it a lot more than his, um, his preview, uh, stuff, like, especially more than the preview in Action 1000, and a lot, uh, and I liked it much, er, I liked it just about as much, a little bit more than the preview in, what was it, Action Comics Special or whatever, um, so it's good. I don't want to give the impression it's not. I, I feel the hype may be a little a little too high on this one, though. But we shall see. Also, points for cover that has nothing to do with what's in the issue. Like, Wonder Woman gets mentioned. And Batman gets mentioned by circumstance. But nothing to do with what's in the issue. <laughs> whatsoever. Um... So this opens with the prelude of many years ago where uh, a council is listening to someone discuss Krypton and how they keep expanding and exploring other planets and colonizing and it will only be a matter of time before they turn to militarism and stoke uh, infighting among the, the places they go to. They are a scour scourge on the galaxy, let it be known. And, I mean, it's it's pretty impressive the scale that this feels that it has. Uh, just based on one character being there. There's a guardian in the background. I'm not entirely sure who everyone else here is, if they even are named characters. To be honest with you, like, I don't know anyone else besides the Guardian. Uh, uh, the Owen, let me put it that way. Um, like, the guy with the white beard over here might be the wizard Shazam, but I don't know. Um, it's, it's hard to tell. Uh, I, I don't know who any of these are, but they're like, the, the, but just having a Guardian of the... Of, of from the Green Lantern Corps there that makes that feel pretty intense um, so they're seriously listening to this guy say that the Kryptonian race is a threat and they must be completely wiped from the galaxy if it is to survive for another generation then it cuts to the present day uh, in Metropolis where uh, Killer Moth has hunted down Garfield Lynn the Firefly um, and is threatening to kill him uh, in exchange for the money. And Garfield lives. You gotta keep your voice down. No, listen. He listens for stuff like this. It's like, what do you think I am, crazy? He's all the way across the world. He can't be hearing this right now. I time this. I time this. I'm smart, not like people. And then all of a sudden, blue red flash, and Superman has taken them both away. Uh. And, you know, that's that's a damn good scene. That was a really good scene. I really quite enjoyed it. Uh, I, <laughs> I like I like the way Superman's talking to the two of the... Or to mainly Firefly. Uh, what happened to guys like you being too scared to set foot in Metropolis? I thought... I thought that was why this place was the perfect place to hide. Good plan. Th thank you. Oh. 
You're being sarcastic. Yes. Ah, oh, that's so good. Um, that, was, that was a lot of fun. That was really enjoyable. Um, and then, just, it's, it's cool to get in Superman's head the way Bendis is here. I'll give him that. Uh, and I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm crapping on this or anything. I did really like it. I just, I don't really see a lot of the hype. Uh, maybe I need to reread it a couple times. Um, but yeah, Superman starts like listening for danger in the city, finds screaming, and heads uh, across town to help with the fire. Though I do like the scene where he's listening and he talks about how he's hearing a girl cover a song. And he can't quite place what the song she's covering is. Um, but he says it's really, really beautiful. So I like that. I just like that, that notion that Superman can just overhear this really personal moment for someone and be moved by it. Um, but then he feels actually a little bad because he was eavesdropping. I will say, small complaint, but the last line of internal monologue Superman has here is that he says, damn it because he, he got distracted listening to the song and he, he didn't get to the the people that needed his help fast enough or, or didn't put it as, as high enough of a priority uh, because he got distracted. And so he says, damn it. Nope. A whole lot of nope. I mean, it's it's definitely an intense situ situation, no lie, but man, I need Superman. I need Superman to not cuss. That's that's one of my things. I'll draw the line at that one. Superman can't cuss. Um, anyway. Uh, so anyway, Superman goes and flies and helps save the people, saves a little girl and some puppies, uh, puts out the fire in a really spectacular way. I like the justification that Bendis uses here. And, and the, the way he panels this out is great, by the way. Uh, so Superman goes and, and starts to try to put out the fire now that everyone's out of the apartment building. And he says, Staccato inhales of super breath should pull most of the fire and smoke away from the building and on into and onto me. And there's not much uh, on me to keep the fire alive. It burns itself out and... Wow. Like, you just have this this great panel of like him explaining what it's going to do and, and everything that's going to happen. And you just cut to the reaction on the ground. Wow. Ah, uh, and then you see what, what he's done is he's pulled all the fire in the building toward himself and it's, it's surrounding and, and burning itself out on him. Uh, and then he starts looking into it and uh, like the cause of the, the fire, because it's the malt, it's the, um, it's been multiple fires. There have been multiple fires in this area in town, if I can talk. Uh, has a flashback during it. Uh, he gets a little distracted, starts talking to a new fire chief um, who asks if she's uh, taller than Wonder Woman, and he says, yes, in fact, you are, which I like that. That's a cute moment. Um, says, uh, you know says that he's suspecting this arson too she agrees and he tells her to uh get in contact with Clark Kent because he's the kind of guy who can help out with stuff like this um so that was cute that was a fun moment uh then we go to a flashback again of the guy who proposed that these galactic figures um take out the uh the kryptonian threat as he sees it um but he's visited by one of the guardians uh appa as a matter of fact and appa's an interesting choice um who says we hear you out we understand your um we understand your your worried uh your your concern but we feel that the Kryptonians need to rise and fall on their own. We do not want to be involved in any kind of action against them. Uh, and so he disappears off and leaves old dude just stewing. And then we're back to the present where Superman finishes his, or Clark finishes his story 
about the arsons, turns it into Perry, who's not thrilled by it. Uh, then Clark goes home to visit Lois and John. Uh, John is having a growth spurt and growing right out of his, his uh, costume, and Lois is too busy to fix it for him. Uh, so I, I kind of like that busy home life, all this craziness. Um, but then blinding flash of light, Clark, Dad, what is it? Oh, and Dad, what is it? Oh, Clark, uh, fade to white, and I'm assuming that's the uh, moment we got from the preview in Action Comics 1000 being set up. Um, so, I don't know. I was really happy with it. I thought this is this is a really good issue. What's what's the live comment saying here? Uh, uh, wow, lots of reaction to this. Um, sacrilege for my thinking. It's pretty good. I'm worried that Bendis tropes would ruin the series like it did with Iron Man and Guardians of the Galaxy. Can't comment on that. Uh, Jake Carlson says this issue was amazing. There was so much natural shifting of tones, and levity was so refreshing. That is a good point. They they did a lot of, of shifting in things. Like on the, the page where we were talking about the um, him listening for screams but being uh, really impressed by this girl's cover song and, and trying to place it. You know, it shifts a lot in that scene. That That is a good point. Um, World's Finest is, is in love with that page. Says so it's the best page in years. Uh... Robert Emmett, Bendis Superman is just a lot of fun. Okay. ABC123, was the lowest stuff revealed in the current run? I've dropped off. Uh, World's Finest says um, that's something being explored in this in this run, I guess. Uh, I adore that page so much. It's such a small moment, but it shows so much of how he cares on a worldwide scale and a personal level. Good point. Uh, also, Ivan Reese and Jay Fabach enough said yeah the art's pretty damn beautiful in here no lie um it's i reese is a fantastic artist uh this page i think impressed me the most um i uh, sorry i need to pull up my cam again yeah this this page right here i really really liked there's a lot going on here especially with the lighting changes that i really like uh and maybe that's related to the x-ray vision or i don't know what but I like that we've gone blue blue eyes for X-ray vision. I'm I'm sure that's probably been done somewhere else, but I haven't seen it. I like that you know red eyes heat vision, blue eyes X-ray vision. That's that's kind of cool. What would microscopic vision be? Green eyes? Purple eyes? Purple eyes? Purple eyes for microscopic? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Robert Emmett agrees with my point that Superman should not say damn it. At worst, it should be darn it. Yeah, that's what I was feeling. It's, it's actually kind of funny because later on he's trying to, you know, save this little girl and she keeps cursing and he's like, hey, language, and she keeps doing it. Uh, so it's, it's kind of this funny little contradiction. Um, uh, seeing Superman's powers use, being used creatively is so refreshing. That's a good point. It's been a while since Superman's done some, like, stuff like that recently where we haven't altered his powers. We've just used his regular power set. Uh, in a creative fashion. So this scene's a really good one for that reason. I'll give you that. Uh, World's Finest says, I'm fine with Superman saying damn it. He's married to Lotus, Lois and it was an internal monologue anyway. Bound to rub off a little. Mm, that's, that's a little weak, bro. Uh, and ABC123 know the Lois stuff will be revealed in this Okay, so this series is focusing on why Lois is no longer working at the Daily Planet. Um, Jake Carlson says, What I thought was weird is that he's about to recommend Lois, but... Re about to recommend Lois, but then backtracks, and it seems like he's upset at Lois for some reason. Maybe I'm reading it wrong. Uh, yeah, I, I think she's not working at the Daily Planet um, at the moment, so he can't recommend that someone go to her because she's not she's not in news right now for some reason um I, i'm so confused it's because lois is missing but she's obviously in the story and in this issue she's talking to someone about a story that she's working on that's 
That's a little weird. Okay. Uh, Kuma Ranger is talking about Green Lantern for some reason. He must be behind. Uh, like an American alien, Superman threatens to shove Lobo's bike up his ass, but that's in Elseworlds. Oh, yeah, God, no, I don't like that. Um... Anyway, plenty of plenty of stuff. Really good book. Uh, honestly, I'm, I really like the the way um, that this this fire chief is drawn. She just looks really good. Like she she looks like she's actually got some scruff on her. It's not like you know lift the helmet and looks immaculate. You, you've seen firefighters are sweating balls. Um, so that was pretty good. I love this expression in this panel as she kind of catches herself saying something about his super hearing. Uh, anyway, that's all good stuff. It's, it's good stuff. I like it. Um, yeah. Solid start. Uh, it's a weekly series, so I will definitely be covering it, uh, week to week. Again, this gets the, the present, or this gets the, the award for cover that has nothing to do with the comic it's, it's about. <laughs> I like, I mean, like, just a cursory introduction scene or something with the Justice League, right? Just anything slightly related to the Justice League. No, nope, not even a little bit. I don't think the League's even mentioned. I'll be right back. I need something to drink. Uh, most professional YouTuber ever. Robert Emmett says, as a former fire cadet, he can uh, confirm that those suits are hot as balls, even without a fire. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, World's Finest is planning to put a tack on my seat while I'm gone. Good luck with that, buddy. Oh, hope everyone's doing good. So I went and bought two of these after work yesterday. Um... And the reason I bought two is because they had a special at the store, and I figured, hey, why not? My air conditioner is broken in my car, and it was hot as balls yesterday driving home. I drank an entire thing in less than two minutes. And then I spent about ten minutes standing up and pissing. Anyway, disgusting details of my life aside. <laughs> oh, oh no. Sorry, Dad. Damn it, Ian, stop drinking Smurf blood. But it's delicious. Gargamel worked for years to get this much Smurf blood. How am I not supposed to drink this shit? Damn it, Ian, stop pissing Smurf blood. Do you have any idea how good it feels to piss Smurf blood? It's amazing. Uh. All right. Let's go ahead and move along to Super Sons Meet Dino Mutt and the Blue Falcon. Number one. God, I love Super Sons so much. Okay, so in DC... Did the Looney Tunes crossover recently? Oh wait, hold on, hold on. I gotta, I gotta stop. I gotta stop. I gotta stop. I gotta go with my joke first. All right, you ready, guys? Doctor Manhattan fucked shit up. Okay, now, um, <laughs> I love, I love 
that joke so much you have no idea. <laughs> that is from now on the justification for everything wrong with the DC Universe. Guys, Dr. Manhattan fucks shit up. Anyway. Uh, and like, like, oh, Jake Carlson. Jake Carlson's mentioned in a Flash crossover with the Hanna-Barbera characters. Dude, 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 dude. You know how, like, you don't like Flash War right now because you feel it's it's rewriting the characters and shit? Dr. Manhattan fucked shit up! <laughs> oh, my. Okay, anyway. So, yeah, DC did the, the first Looney Tunes crossover for Rebirth, and then they did the Hanna-Barbera characters, and now they're doing Hanna-Barbera again. And so we're getting um, Super Sons meet Dino Mutt and the Blue Falcon. Uh, full disclosure, I have no idea who the fuck Dino Mutt or, nor the Blue Falcon are. I, I'm not a Hanna-Barbera fan. As, as far as I'm concerned, Hanna-Barbera is kind of from the dark age of animation. Uh, in a lot of ways, a lot of that late 60s, 70s, and early 80s shit is just straight garbage and can be thrown away and you don't lose anything. Um, anyway, uh... <laughs> Philip Kenton says, don't blame Smurf God, Ian, that's blasphemy. Yeah, shit, he might explode the fuck out of me. <laughs> uh, Smurf of me. <laughs> anyway, see, so yeah, I have no idea who the fuck Dino Mutt or Blue Falcon are, it are or, or who really most of the Hanna-Barbera characters are. Like, like I do Space Ghost and, and, and a couple of the others, but... Now they're, I feel they're really scraping the barrel for some of these. Um, anyway, but that being said, this is a damn good issue. This is like a really, really good comic book on multiple levels. It's a great Super Sun story. It's a pretty good, like, like you could have told me that Blue Falcon and Dino Mutt are legit like DC Silver Age characters that no one's done shit with for decades. And this is Peter J. Tomasi coming up with a cool story to, to like, reintroduce them to the DC Universe. And I totally would have believed you. Um, anyway, uh, so this tells the origin of Blue Falcon and Dino Mutt. How Blue Falcon, whose name is, uh, shit, what is it? Radley... Uh, Crown. Radley Crown is Blue Falcon's actual name. Uh, how he got a puppy for his birthday named Mutt, uh, and they became the best of friends playing and growing together, uh, and until Mutt got just really too old, but Radley being the, the genius that he was, couldn't let him go. So he used his technology to save him. Uh, and then we cut to the modern day where uh, John, with his family, uh, Lois and Clark, are at a funeral for someone who used to work at the Daily Planet. Um, and they're sitting there viewing the body, and John feels really, really uncomfortable around a dead body like this, uh, really can't stand it, is, is not okay, so he runs out, uh, just to get some fresh air, uh, and then, while well, he's sitting there, this place is freaking depressing. Robin, just fucking god, I love Damien so much. You got your work clothes? Yeah? <laughs> Let's get out of here. God, that's so perfect! Oh my god, Damien's the best friend ever! Oh, I love it so much. God, these two are, be are, are the best of friends in the best possible way. That's so damn charming. Oh. Like, I remember being, like, like younger and my... My cousin was having a, a baby shower upstairs, and I was just like, God, get me the fuck out of here. And I just didn't have anywhere to go. Everyone else was out of town. And then, like, one of my friends just came by. and was like, hey, Ian, can you hang out? I was like, fuck yes, just let's go. 
and just that that feeling of being in an uncomfortable situation where you're you're not like ready for it uh or or aware of your surroundings enough not knowing what to do and then just have your friend show up and give you the opportunity to leave that's what peter j tomasi has done so wonderfully with the super sun series is he's he's done what comic books are meant to do which is take a real life situation a real life relatable thing and then just superhero fight it put it up on a grand ridiculous scale so yeah it's the it's the friend bailing you out of an awkward situation you don't want to be in when you're young um and then uh just just like getting to to get pulled out of that uh man it's so good anyway so yeah damien and, and john are about to sneak out and go on patrol but then suddenly uh robotic paw comes out of nowhere and grabs john on the shoulder they turn around and we see dino mutt who damien knows very well because damien reveals that dino mutt is uh of course, the crime-fighting partner of Blue Falcon, who was a member of Batman Inc. Yes! Yes! <laughs> Goal! <laughs> oh, I was so happy when I read that panel. You have no idea how awesome that felt. Oh my God, that was perfect. That was ab. Oh, what a retcon! What a retcon! And once again, Dr. Manhattan fucked shit up! <laughs> ah. Man. That's too good. That's just too fucking good. Oh. Anyway, so yeah, uh, so Damien and John bring Dino Mutt back to the uh, manor tower, or whatever, uh, to try to repair his operating system. Dino Mutt explains that Blue Falcon has been uh, mind controlled by their worst enemy, and they've got to try to save him. Uh, but before the repairs on Dino Mutt could be finished. Blue Falcon uh, shows up, takes out the boys, and steals Dino Mutt. Um, luckily, of course, the boys are able to recover and start getting across town uh, to where they know he's taking Dino Mutt. Uh, and, yeah, they're able to uh, get there and start fighting uh, the Red Vulture, who's, I guess, a Blue Falcon character. Um, they're able to start fighting the Red Vulture and, and Blue Falcon and yada yada yada, and they're trying to get Blue Falcon to snap out of the mind control, but he's apparently been completely overtaken by the, the uh, Red Vulture uh, to the point where the person that was there is now gone, has been deleted. Um... And then, like, Dino Mutt has this great scene uh, where, like, Falcon's about to kill the Superboys, uh, the Super Sons, um, and Dino Mutt shows up and says, I've got one thing to say to you, old buddy. Not on my watch. I don't want to do this. My friend still has to be somewhere inside that controlled brain. He was here, but I killed him. Stabbed him right in the heart where the memory of you lived. And he bled out. He said you were nothing more to him than a pet with delusions of grandeur. Well, if BF's gone, then I guess it's y okay if I tell you a secret. See, he thought BF stood for Blue Falcon. But the truth is, it always stood for best friend. I'm totally fucking sold on Dino Mutt and Blue Falcon. Give Tomasi a book. I'm there. I'm there for it, man. Holy shit. That's so good. It's a fucking robot dog, but I, I don't care. It's what the shit. That was so good. That was what? 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 
<laughs> like, Jesus fucking Christ, that was an amazing moment. Where did that come from? <laughs> Oh, it's so like he says he's, it stood for best friend, and then you just get oh my god, it's so precious. Where did that come from? Oh my god, right in the feels. Oh, oh I've been hitting the feels, man. Oh. Dead instantly. Um. So. That gives Blue Falcon enough pause and makes Red Falcon decide to destroy him, finally. Um, this puts Dino Mutt into a murderous rage and shows just how fucking cool you could make this in the comics. Uh, if you wanted to go with, like, a darker tone. But Damien talks him down for murder. Um, and Dino Mutt and the boys mourn Blue, Blue Falcon. Uh... And then there's a funeral, and now Damien and John are, are attending the funeral with their families. And John finally understands the purpose of the funerals, the need for funerals now. And I, I, I love it. It's such a tender moment. De death scares the heck out of me, so I never really took a long, hard look at it. Now I kind of get that funerals can help prepare us for whatever is coming. No one lives forever. And then Damien just like, ah, oh, it's so per it's such a great friendship. Sometimes you can be pretty dark, John Kent, and I'm saying that as a guy who works with the Batman. Like, oh, that's such a great, like, way to just, you know, John learns an important lesson, but he's still a boy, he's st they're, they're still friends, and they still, like, they're gonna move on. They're gonna still have their lives. They're gonna keep going, but now John's learned something. Um, man! Oh, that's so good. Tomasi killed it. Like, like the the issue 13, or no, 16, whatever it was, uh, last week, or earlier this month, whatever it was, was really good and, and a nice send-off to the series. This is also a great conclusion to the series, man. <laughs> I don't know what this will be connect collected in. I know with the DC Looney Tunes uh, event, they collected all that just into one trade. Um... This, I, I imagine the same happened with the first volume of Hanna-Barbera crossovers they did. I'm kind of hoping that this just gets collected with Super Sons, to be honest. Because I, I want people to be able to read this in context of the rest of Super Sons. Because to me, it's not just a random crossover with Dino Mutt. It's a continuation of Damien and John's story. I really love it. Oh. Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, and then at the end, Dino Mutt digs up his master's grave, his best friend's grave, uh, and hooks BF into the machine that BF used to save his life when he was an old dying dog um, and reignite him and bring him back to life. Uh... And Blue Falcon's first words after being brought back into the world uh, are Dino, good boy. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. This is a really, really good issue. Uh, I highly recommend this. This was a lot of fun. This is, uh, it's, it's, it's fun. It's a good story. It's got the feels. It's got the cleverness. Ah, oh, the fucking Batman Inc. retcon. Oh, that's so perfect. Because <laughs> that's exactly what Blue Falcon would have been. Oh, man. Great issue. Great issue. I didn't buy any of the other Hanna-Barbera crossovers, because, again, I don't really care that much for Hanna-Barbera. Uh, this kind of makes me wish I did, because that was a really good issue. All right, give me a sec, give me a sec, give me a sec. I'm talking for an hour, and I'm still not done. I still got two singles in trade to talk about. Man. Everyone doing good in the live comments? Seems like you dropped off. You got Man of Steel and you're just out of here? You didn't stay for the Super Sons? For shame. For shame. Alright. 
Let's go ahead and go on to Batman Prelude to the Wedding, number one. Uh, Robin versus Ra's al Ghul. This is really good. Uh, I really enjoyed this. First of all, I should say I am a sucker for literally anything, no matter how tangential, that gives us a look at future Damian Batman. Uh, fair warning, this isn't like in canon, this isn't a flash forward, this is just a hallucination, but it does give us a look at future Damian Batman. So I'm, I'm in it for that, if nothing else. Um, anyway, but I also really love the premise of where this book starts and where it ends. The way that this is bookended is really, really strong, and I really, really like it. So it starts off with Selina accompanying Damien to get his wedding attire made. To get, like, his, his outfit for the wedding tailored. Um, that's really, I don't know, that's that's such a cool little moment. Um, like, that's, that's exactly what that relationship should be. Like, they're kind of feeling each other out, kind of getting used to each other and everything. And Damien is kind of a jerk like he's always been uh he's always been a bit of a jerk um man like at one point the the tailor pricks damien uh while he's you know getting his his thing together um and catwoman as they're leaving she says I have to say, I was impressed with how you handled that in there. For a second, I thought I was going to have to jump in and save that guy from being force-fed his own pins. Damien, like, breaks down his own his history and everything. He's like, listen, I'm not that guy anymore. I've matured. Uh, that was a lifetime ago. I've changed, matured. And I no longer need a monitor like Dick Grayson or anyone else constantly whispering in my ear like some smug angel on my shoulder. And since we're on the subject of things I don't need, let's tear off the bandage now. I suppose you'll want me to call you mother. And I just love Selena's reaction to this. Ah, oh. Like, just look at that face. I'm so sorry for my camera, but look at that facial reaction that she has. Just like, that cut deep real quick. Uh, and, like, I love, she, she doesn't even know how to address it. She just... It's it's getting late. I should probably get going. Wedding prep. You don't have to be coy with me. I'm aware of the illicit rituals involved in celebrating the waning days of the Bachelorette's freedom. I'll just celebrate my father's secret nuptials my own way. Don't, uh, don't stay out too late. This celebration begins by asking a simple question. What good are the infiltration skills of an ancient order of assassins if I can't occasionally use them? To get into an arcade after business hours, bypassing lions and gawkers, and rise through the ranks of Cheese Viking. I love Damien so much. Seeley wrote Damien fucking brilliantly. He's, he's got that right balance of Damien's still a jerk. Damien will always be off-putting. And, and... I fucking relate to that. There are people who, who, no matter what I do, just don't like me. Uh, I I fully am aware that I am I am an acquired taste of a personality, which is probably why I don't have the biggest YouTube following. Whatever. I'm, I'm perfectly aware of that. But, it, like, you get to know me, I promise I'm a cool dude at the end of the day. I, I promise you, right? So... Like, Damien's, you know, he's a bit of a jerk, he's a bit off-putting, just being honest with what he's thinking of Selena, how he's feeling about her uh, coming into his life. But he's also a kid, and he wants to go get the high score in a video game, because that's important. It's very important. I love it. Uh, man, that's so good. I love it so much. Uh, anyway, so uh, then then there's the meat of the issue, the Damien versus Ra's al Ghul. I will say, I hate this cover. Uh, not that it's it's drawn badly or anything. I hate this cover because it tells you what should be a reveal in the issue. Um, so Damien 
while he's breaking into this arcade, has his line cut, and then is dealing with this guy, uh, who calls himself Ion, A-I-O-N, like lion, but Ion. Uh, anyway, and so Damien has to start fighting him, and it's, it's a whole battle, and Ion's talking the whole time, and, uh, you know, trying to distract him, and I love Damien's line here. You think this prattling distracts me. It gives you an edge. This is a technique used by former Robins. I find it undignified. And just fucking throws him into a video game cabinet. But oh no! Oh no! It was the arcade cabinet that he needed to get the high score on! <laughs> oh, it's so good! Mm, God, Jake Carlson's in the comments saying I was, getting, I was going to get this but decided against it. Is it worth it? It's so worth it. It's so worth it. Damien is so perfect in this. Damien's one of my favorite characters in comics right now. And God, he's been written so well recently. I know when he first showed up there, that people had a lot of trouble writing him and, and really getting a strong voice for him. Right now, Damien, Damien's being written some primo shit. Oh, man. So anyway, keeps fighting this guy who reveals that he is... Uh, the son of Bruce Wayne and Selina Kyle. Uh, that he is their long lost child, the true heir. That Damien's a a bastard for, with a stolen legacy, uh, and that that uh, you know this kid's the uh, the true heir, uh, the the winged lion, um. No matter how far into the past you reach, grasping for a simpler time, I'm sorry to tell you, you can't stay there. You can't escape now. The moment, the future supplants you. I'm that future, Damien. I'm the son of Batman had by choice with the only woman he ever truly loved. The only son he raised from birth. You, you're a forgotten mistake, fella. A stolen legacy. A bastard. And so, like, your immediate reaction is like, wait, wait, is this some kind of, like, weird continuity shit? What's going on with this? What's happening? Uh, this pisses Damien off, and he's tripping drugs that this, this kid slipped him. Um, and so, like, he's imagining himself as the future failure Batman, uh, pummeling the, the kid to death, uh, about to kill him, when he realizes, oh, this is real. None of this makes sense. Nothing's going on. Uh... And he comes back to reality and says, I'm a 13, I'm 13 years old in an arcade on the eve of Batman's wedding. I'm entertaining a guest. Hello, grandfather. And then you get the page turn, you get Ra's al Ghul. And that should have been the fucking reveal. I should have seen Ra's al Ghul on the fucking cover. God damn it. Why do comics do that? I would have bought it just for Damien. <laughs> Why? Why a comic story has got to be like that, man? You know, it's just not... It's just not fair. You know, speaking of this series, though, before I go on... I was only planning to get this issue because, you know, Damien. Um, then I saw a tweet for <laughs> what the next issue is going to be with Nightwing. And I saw one panel from one page and immediately knew I had to get it. Because it's Dick Grayson and Superman in the backseat of a limo saying... Bachelor party. I'm like, yep, yep. Gotta get it. Gotta get it. Gotta get it. Gotta get it. That's that. I, just, I, I, I gotta get that. I, how, how do you? How do you not? How do? You, how do you not get that? <laughs> um, so I'm definitely excited to see this series continue, uh, just based on that premise. But anyway, so Damien now has to deal with. Now Damien knows who he's fighting. It's Raz Al Ghul, and he's uh, Raz is of course testing him to see if Damien has any use for him now that Bruce has found his true love uh, and and so he reveals that 
all of what he showed Damien was a a ploy to show him his greatest fears of what he feared to become and and if he'd have the the strength of character to do anything about it and of course since he's been poisoned by his father's foolish ideology of you shouldn't kill people he's not going to and so Damien's truly useless to him um and anyway so Roz just leaves Damien's not even worth his time to kill uh, and then we get to the conclusion of this as Damien makes his way home. Uh, Selena gets home, clearly buzzed. Let's be kind and call it buzzed. Uh, and she's stumbling in and Damien's sitting by fire and says, Miss Kyle. And she's like, Damien, why aren't you in bed or out scaring criminals other than me? I have some questions for you. First, I wonder if you might have any idea why it is that my grandfather knew about Catwoman's engagement to my father. And second, are you and my father planning on having children? That's so good. Ah, oh, That is the perfect way to approach it. Because yeah, Roz is, is right. Damien is afraid of being supplanted. Damien's jealousy of um dick jason tim uh all the other surrogate children of bruce wayne um damien's jealousy of them has been clearly noted uh you know was in batman and son he, he tried to kill tim drake uh right away so like he's is he's always had this underlying thing and, and the idea of more children showing up really does on some level scare him and so he wants to to talk about it and confront Selena about it. And then here's the part where the book really, really sells it for me. Um, I, wow, uh, no idea on the first one, but that's definitely concerning. And the second one, well, I'm not sure that's a conversation I need to have with you. Please. Okay, well, Batman, your dad and I haven't gotten around to discussing that subject yet. We've been busy, so busy, um, you know, fighting villains. But if I'm being honest, I don't think I should have a kid. No matter what Bruce's opinion on the subject, I've been a thief, a supervillain, a mob boss. I do bad more often than I do laundry. And even when I try to be better, I can't escape my past. I don't think I could raise someone to be better than me. Because I don't think I could expect someone to raise above their own baggage and mine. Most people can't. They're not strong enough. Not like you. And I don't think I'd be lucky enough to have another Damian Wayne. Are you serious? Yep. But I'll tell you what. We're living in a house full of goody-goodies. People like you and me have to stick together. You don't ever have to call me mom. But if you'll have my back, I promise... I'll have yours. Deal? Yes. You have a deal. <sighs> Man. That's a great scene. Again, it's doing that perfect comic book thing of taking a very real thing that people relate to, people have. You know, my parents were divorced before I could even... I, I cannot even remember a point at which my parents were together. So, men dating my mother was something I was used to. My father dating women was exceptionally rare. But I, I was aware of the existence of the possibility of people coming into my life. And I remember having conversations with it like this. I remember having conversations with, with one of my mom's long-term boyfriends about how he felt about her and how he was going to treat her and all this stuff. And like, I was a kid, it went over my head a little bit. Um, but I, it's still, you know, you needed to, to hear that. Uh, so this is, whoo, that's a really good scene that, that Selena and Damien have this in common. They're, they're the two with the darkest past in a house full of goody, goody two shoes. Like, you know, I was, what was it? Deadpool two last uh, week. I was watching that in theaters and, and, Spoiler alert, but like, small spoiler, but one of the lines he has in that is, 
Yeah, superheroes are all great and all, but god damn if they aren't the biggest group of fucking teacher's pets. And that drives me nuts. And you know what? Like, yeah. Yeah, I totally get it, man. And and so Damien and, and Selena having this, this connection of they don't have the, the moral upstanding history that, that a lot of these heroes do. That's a really, really great moment. This is a solid fucking comic. This is great character development for Damien. And of course it does the thing that comics do. It takes a very real human thing and blows it up on a giant superhero scale. So how does Damien confront these feelings he's having of, of you know, semi-animosity towards Selena Kyle coming into his life? I'm not going to call you mom. He goes and fights his, his supervillain grandfather and, and is confronted with his fears of being replaced, of not mattering anymore, in the form of a, a psychoactive illusion or some shit. Wow, that's good shot. That's just good shit. Uh, sorry, I gotta time out somebody uh, for at least 300 seconds, if not just straight block them. Ah. Uh. Man. But yeah, that, that moment's really, really good. And then there's the epilogue. Ra's al Ghul gets back to his hideout and finds one assassin left, blind, his eyes scorched from his head. And the assassin says, He blinded me, did God knows what to the others, and all he asked me was this, if we'd gotten an invite. What kind of person does all this over a wedding, Ra's al Ghul? snaps the dude's neck and says, I don't have any use for a assa uh, sightless assassin. But to your query, young man, I believe I have some idea. Holy shitballs! <laughs> man. The Joker is fucking on a rampage. Now, of course, this begs the question, can the Joker seriously fucking kill all of the like Razogul's personal escort of League of Assassins members. I don't know. Maybe. Uh the Joker's physical capability is always something of interest. Um but regardless of all that, I have no doubt in my mind he could come up with a plan to kill them. To be fair, uh ninjas just in anything, seem to be like the biggest hyped up villains, but they seem to be the easiest to kill or, or defeat. Um, ninjas are always easy to take down. Oh, World's Finest brings up um, a good point. He says, I don't think he did it physically. I could see him maybe making them kill each other. Sugar has been known to do that, like hit people with like psychoactives and, and stuff and make them, put them into a frenzy till they kill each other. Um... That, I could see that happening. Uh, that could that could be a plausible way to do it, if we ever address this. Because if you notice, the the League of Assassins aren't, like, smiling or gassed or anything. They've, they've all fallen victim to their own weapons. Um, so they've either been used against each other or on themselves. Um, so, yeah. I'm, I'm hella excited for that. Uh, man, this is a good-ass issue. This is just fucking brilliant, man. I love stuff like this. Jake Carlson says, I might go back tomorrow and get this issue. It's worth it. If you like Damien as a character, this is a good Damien issue. I'll tell you that much. This is a, a great tie-in to King's Run. Um, I don't think it's it's needed... Like, I don't think it's necessary to understand what Tom King's doing. I feel that we got this sense of Damien that he's, he's not necessarily in love with having someone come in and, and, you know, replace his mother as it were, but he understands that his father needs it and he's trying to be a good son. And this, like, so there's, there's already the acceptance of Catwoman. This 
is kind of building Selena and Damien's relationship. This is building some of the groundwork for that, uh, possibly going forward. And I really like that. That's that's really cool. Uh, Robert Emmett says, "What do you call a ninja clown?" I don't know, Robert Emmett. What? A mime, silent and easy to beat up. <laughs> That's, that's a good point. Hey, did any of you guys go see the, the Ninja Parade? Yeah, me either. It was awesome. <laughs> I love that joke so much. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going digital, so I need just a moment to make sure everything is working properly as I do this. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Let's see if I go over here. Okay, come on, thing. Work with me. Thing, just catch up to where I'm at in the stream. This is annoying. I can't stand that shit. I have such a hard time with this sometimes. How does a ninja screw in a light bulb? I don't know how. What the shit? Ah, I'm gonna reload this page. Give me a sec, guys. I'm sorry. In the shadows. <laughs> oh, that's good stuff, man. That's good stuff. Okay, good. I do have this up. Sorry, it's hard to tell sometimes and YouTube and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, so yes, the next book we were talking about is The Invasion from Planet WrestleTopia. T number two, two worlds enter, one leaves. Oh, man. Okay, so yes, this is the second issue in the series. It was sent to me by, um, oh, what's the name of the, the company? I, I feel bad. I'm terrible. Um sent to me by the publisher they're they're doing some promotion and i'm always down to talk about something like that especially since i got it for free so i want to say thanks to them uh i want to make sure you guys can still hear me i'm gonna assume yes it makes sense that you would anyway uh yes yeah, so i got that i got this from them for free that was a much appreciated uh gift in exchange for a review so hey here we go another thing for comic reviews um so if you don't know, I already talked about issue number one, and the, the main premise of that was the main character we were following uh, pulled a stunt on live TV, proclaiming himself not the grand champion of the, um, of the state or the, the uh, world, but the grand champion of the entire galaxy. And that message got to the alien wrestling galactic champion and he was mad and so now we have a problem but we start off this issue with a flashback uh seeing some of the problems that uh this guy went through as a kid some of the interactions he had um and it's you know it's great because it, it does a lot to humanize the character and that's just a, a cool thing because you know you think wrestling and and the premise is obviously a little silly uh so to to like ground it to humanize it in the way that this sequence does is really impressive and i really don't think i even have to explain to you what's going on i feel like you can look at what the panels are and it tells you all the story you need to know about like what happened with this kid's life in, in the early days um so i think that's pretty cool anyway uh now dude's all grown up and he is uh down on his luck sleeping in you know the desert basically uh but his proclamation of being galactic grand champion is now becoming a problem because aliens have arrived and they're engineering a gigantic steel cage around the earth um and it's at this point that the aliens invade uh, and we get a proclamation over, of course, 
national or worldwide broadcast. I love that it starts off with old dude getting hit in the face with a chair. That's fucking genius. The, using the tropes of wrestling that like the w- general public is familiar with in this way is really fun. Um, and then we get our our evil uh, professional wrestling alien champion. And so I'm gonna do I'm gonna do my professional wrestling voice because I find this really really amusing. People of the earth, not long ago I received a communication that distressed me. It said, "Manifest destiny. You are not the one true galactic champion." It said, "No, there is another." All oh, the stars they shook and many moons did quake for the. <laughs> Shit, I lost my spot. <laughs> For there was a disharmony in the heavens. And who has created these unpleasantries? One man, Rory Landell. And so we see that chaos is is breaking out as the alien wrestle invaders from planet Wrestletopia uh, are taking over the White House and, and scouring the world for Rory Landell, who proclaimed himself the gl- true galactic champion. Uh... And Manifest Destiny is challenging him and anyone else who would like to challenge for the belt. Uh, and so, yeah, there's this big hunt to go find Rory and, and get him uh, to the the location he needs to go. And some other wrestlers from around the world show up and, and they start fighting him. So now he has to get in an actual fight and yada, yada, yada. Uh, and now we're just, we're in a situation, uh, they knock him out and, and they're taking him away somewhere. So, and then there's another flashback to conclude the story. Um, man, I was so into this. This is a lot of fun. This, I don't know, it's just really enjoyable storytelling. It's, it's accessible and making a little, like humanizing it with stuff like this in the flashback is a really strong idea. It, it makes it much more relatable. So you realize that. Yes, there is the Earth being put into a giant steel cage to by alien invaders from planet Russeltopia. But also, you know, it's not forgetting to be a little human. So it's it's a multi-level story that's that's got some layers to it, and I, I really appreciate it for that. Um, not sure what to say about the art. It's, it's pretty good. I like it. I like that we're getting uh, a pretty diverse... Um, physicality of characters like we got kind of an older guy got a uh black woman here who's more of uh you know more significant weight that's pretty good um you know just to get that that nice variety that diversity in in body shape and and art i i don't know whether details like that were in the script but to to put it in artistically uh it's it's integrated well she looks good um and it just it rounds out the world a lot more, uh, no pun intended. So I really appreciate it for that. Um, Manifest Destiny has a cool look. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe this is just me. I I have a personal pet peeve thing about. I don't like the trope of aliens that are just humans but not from Earth. Um, I really tend to to get tired of that sci-fi trope. Um, so I'm a little disappointed that the, the invaders from planet WrestleTopia are just, you know, humans. Um, but I don't know, maybe we'll get some more alien, alien, proper extraterrestrial looking, uh, characters as this goes on. That's, that's at least a hope for me. Um, anyway, it's quite good. Uh, you can get it on, I believe, Amazon and Comixology. I'll put links in the description to the websites it's available on. If you are into the whole professional wrestling thing, this will probably be a fun treat for you. And again, like I said, it's got some got some humanity to it, some pathos. That's important too. Um, and also, uh, old dude got hit with a chair. That's enjoyable to me. All right, let's bring back the cam. Uh, <laughs> oh man, that's good stuff. World's Finest says, give me a xenomorph in tight wrestling shorts. <laughs> oh. Man. What's going on in the live comments? <laughs> mm. 
Man, we got a lot of live comments all for Invasion from Planet Russeltopia, so that's pretty good. Um, cool. Glad glad you guys are liking it. Uh, yeah, I'll make sure to put uh, links in the description uh, for where to go buy it at. So check that after the live show concludes. Oh, man. All right. I'm gonna need I'm gonna need more of that. <laughs> that was not enough. Let me get uh you guys I'll I'll talk to you for a minute if you uh if you wanna chat uh for a bit before I go to trade talk. Though we're closing in on two hours, so I gotta be quick about this. <sighs> Alright. Well, <laughs> anyway, I know it's so enjoyable to watch me like drink and stuff, but seriously, you try talking just by yourself for like an hour and 40 minutes and, and see how you feel. All right, let's go ahead and go on to Trade Talk then. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Trade Talk. As promised, we are out of the DC stuff for a little bit, taking a journey away, and we'll be talking about Venom vs. Carnage today. Though I have a brief announcement first, uh, you may of course notice that this episode was not uploaded on Friday, as has been the normal day, it was uploaded on Monday, as will be the normal day. I went over this during the live show, but I'll just quickly recap. Switching some things around on the channel to try to streamline things, make things a little bit easier on myself, make uh, some of the other content, give it a little more exposure. So the new schedule will go from Sunday to Saturday. Uh, Sundays, regular episode of Geeky Gentleman discussion slash review slash what have you. Uh, Mondays will be the day for Trade Talk Now. Tuesdays will be Geeky Gentleman character discussions. Wednesdays will still be new comic book reviews. Thursdays, Geeky Gentleman fan film reviews. Fridays, there will be a clip uploaded from Geeky Gentleman. It'll just be a clip of each episode from the week. So if you missed an episode or if you were maybe kind of on the fence of where, whether you'd be interested in the episode, I recommend watching the clip because it'll give you a preview of, of every episode that was uploaded that week. So uh, that'll be cool. And then um, Saturdays are still in flux as to what whether or not anything gets posted there Saturdays are, are what I tend to use for my monthly shows like Comic Book Club and um, Monthly Comic Roundup. So anyway, so that's that's that. Now back to the book itself. So Venom Carnage, this is written by Peter Milligan, right? Yeah, Peter Milligan with art by Clayton Crane. Um, so I really like Venom. I really, really like Venom. Venom's just like, ever since I was a kid, cool-ass character. Venom, I, I, the first comic book I ever bought was a Venom comic. I remember walking in the store and, and saying, I want a comic book with Venom in it. And they gave me a random comic book with Venom in it. Um, I don't know if I even still have that. I'd have to go look for it. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so, love Venom. Uh, always, always had a love affair with Venom. He's like buff, scary Spider-Man. Uh, Carnage, also really cool. The symbiotes are my crack when it comes to Spider-Man. What can I tell you? Um, is this a good book? Eh. Do I care if it's good? Not particularly because of, you know... Clayton Craig kind of fucking murders this book in the best possible way. Um, like, I mean, that's that's a pretty good one. I want to see it on the proper page if I can. There we go. Yeah. I don't give a shit about the story anymore. That's why I'm reading this book now. That is the only reason I am reading this book from this point on is this shit right there. Fucking murders this book on the art. Clayton Craig does a beautiful job rendering Venom and Carnage and making them look distinct and cool and creepy as fuck. Oh my god, he kills it. Um, 
The story here is actually not that complicated. Uh, so for those that don't know the history, well, I mean, it's comic books, so it's always complicated. For those that don't know the history of Venom and Carnage, uh, the Venom symbiote is an alien life form that bonded with Spider-Man uh, until Spider-Man, of course, rejected it, and then it bonded with Eddie Brock uh, and, and turned into Venom. Um, during one of his escapes from prison, uh, Eddie Brock was roomed up with Cletus Cassidy, a infamous serial killer. Um, and during his escape, the Venom symbiote uh, reproduced and left its air behind and the air attached itself to Cletus Cassidy. Uh, and that's how you got Carnage, the serial killer symbiote. Um, the, the symbiotes do not give a shit about their offspring whatsoever. Until now. Uh, in this story, Venom is telling uh, Carnage that he is soon to, uh, to reproduce. There's nothing he can do to stop it. It's just part of their biology. Um, and because his will be an important offspring uh, on a generational turn, they actually do have to do something to care for it to a degree. Um, and Venom has already named the offspring it shall be called Toxin. But of course, Carnage being a murderous serial killer doesn't want anything to do with its offspring, and so if he can't stop it from happening, he will kill it the first chance he gets. Um, and the offspring gets attached to a police officer um, who's got a family of his own, you know, baby and all that jazz. Uh, so Carnage is trying, or Venom wants to protect the police officer and in turn the, the baby Toxin, um, and Carnage wants to kill him. Uh, and Spider-Man's, of course, caught up in the middle of all this and yada yada yada. Uh, just, god damn. That's too much good in two pages. God, that's oh, so good. So good. So much so good. Um, so I just want to stop talking about this shit. Black Cat gets involved and is kind of on the cop side. And and the cop's slowly uh, morphing into Toxin. And he can't, um, can't quite control what's happening to him. Uh, he eventually has to morph into Toxin to try to protect himself from Carnage at one point. Um, and then the rest of the book's kind of him learning to deal with that and the implications of being a super... Uh, super powered individual now. I will say, since I want to start talking about the art, um, I actually don't like some of the choices made for Toxin. Uh, I get that it's the offspring of Carnage, so it should probably in some way resemble him. But to be fair, how much does Carnage really resemble Venom? I feel like you've got a lot of, of room to play around with that. Um... <laughs> And I really, really think that Toxin should have been literally any other color but red or black. And instead, he is... he's, he's red and black. Um, like, it's not like he's got the same, um, I don't know, what would you call that? Interchangeable, uh, you know, is Carnage more red or black? I, I don't fucking know, it's both. Uh... You know, there's there's a much clearer divide between the red and black parts of Toxin, but I don't know. I think they should have gone with a different color scheme because, especially given that that the symbiotes are are shape changing to a degree, um, some of these pages it starts to get a little hard to follow some of the actions. So I don't know, like green, blue, whatever color, orange even. Um, whatever color and it's, it's a different enough shade of red i don't have too hard a time telling what's going on in this i'm just eh. I, I was not thrilled with that choice uh anyway uh the police officer that is now toxin starts to learn how to get a little bit of control over it and he thinks he can still have his normal life and and deal with the superpower and and he tries to use his superpowers now to uh 
stop a bank robbery that it's too dangerous for the police officers to go into. Um, and in the middle of intimidating these, these thugs, uh, these bank robbers, you are heartless killers. You killed a cop who no doubt had a family who will be heartbroken. You deserve to die in the most painful and heartless way imaginable. Your brains may be soft and eggy, no doubt, evolved over thousands of years so you can waste them. I'll suck them through your eye sockets. Uh, so anyway, that like that's the, the level of violence that the, the symbiote's inspiring in the guy. So he realizes uh, that he, he's not safe uh, with this thing inside of him. His family isn't safe around him. Um, eventually, Spider-Man uh, teams up with them and they're able to defeat Carnage and Venom so that they won't come after him anymore. Um, but the officer realizes that his family just straight up isn't safe with him around. So he decides to leave his wife and newborn. Uh, just straight walk out on them and go be toxin somewhere else um and yeah i actually quite like that ending and it's not a bad story overall it's a pretty cool premise to play around with the whole venom carnage thing but you're kidding yourself if you're here for anything else besides the amazing art i'll say some of the the human um stuff particularly the faces is a bit much like this panel of of old do right there that almost looks like something out of mad magazine um but maybe that's just part of his style of how he's able to draw these you know fantastic looking monstrous images venom carnage toxin maybe that's just part of his style of of really over exaggerated craziness and it works really well for the monsters and stuff not so well for the people and you know what? The people aren't the thing I'm interested in the book. Uh, so it's fine if they're they're less than perfect. But like, God, some of this art is just killing it for me. I fucking love it. Uh, it's so cool. It looks so good. <laughs> oh, I can just drool over all this stuff. And with it's Venom and Carnage, it's kind of appropriate. Uh, so yeah, Venom vs. Carnage. Um... I love that it's Venom Carnage on the cover, but Venom vs. Carnage on the spine, because there's clearly no verse on the cover. Uh, whatever works, y'all, whatever works. Um, yeah, so anyway, this is just... The art in here is fantastic. Black Cat, uh, sometimes she works a bit better, sometimes she's drawn fine, sometimes not. Uh, she's the most like consistently human character that that we're seeing as human the most uh that has anything to do with the story and she's mostly fine there's a couple awkward panels of her here and there i've never liked black cat's costume it just gets kind of ridiculous to me um like there's no way she doesn't slip a tit in that fucking costume i'm sorry there's there's no fucking way um but whatever it's it, that that's just the guy sure like this is just fucking stupid um but, like, as far as the, the, the... Artists can't do anything about the way her costume was designed. Um, but as far as the way she's rendered, most of the time it's all right. Uh, like, this this top panel up here is a little suspect, something about that. But I think that might just be in the facial expression. Um, given that it's supposed to be kind of like a sly or wiry expression. Um, or wily? Wily would be a better word. Um... But, again, she's mostly fine, and, and she's the one we're seeing as human most often. Uh, some of the, the police officer's family members uh, show up, too, and they, they look fine to just okay. Um, nothing like... Like, I, I say that I think the people are the, the weakest part of it, the, the drawings on people's faces and stuff are, and I'll probably stand by that, but it's not nearly as enough to to make me lose interest in the way the uh the art is conveying stuff like just god when venom and carnage team up oh uh venom eventually decides that toxin's too much of a threat because he might join spider-man um 
And so he and Carnage team up to, to try to take out Toxin because Venom was wrong about him. Um, but like, God, some of this... <sighs> Look at that! Oh, it's so good! The symbiotes are the fucking coolest villains in Spider-Man. Convince me otherwise. I dare you. You can't because it's impossible because they rock. Oh, I love it. Um, so yeah, you just get some great stuff. Like, oh god, this number four cover. Oh, that is so perfect. Venom, Carnage, and Toxin caught between the two of them. Oh, I love this shit. God, the art in here is beautiful. I can just fawn over this shit. The detail in it, the the lighting, the way the light like falls off of them. Um, look at the translucency put into the the symbiote eye there, so you can see the the officer underneath. Oh, man, oh God, I love this. This is. I like really, really abstract comic book art. I like really, really realistic comic book art. And I like really, really simplistic, minimalistic comic book art. This is on that side of realism where I really, really get into it. It's, it's hyper-exaggerated, but rendered realistically, which is cool as shit. Um, so really, the highlight on this is is Clayton Craig. Um, Crane, sorry. Clay Clayton Crane just murders this book in the best possible way. Um, absolutely adore this stuff. <sighs> just trying to find other good-ass panels to show you guys. Uh, yeah, when fucking Toxin gets buff as shit, that's pretty cool. Um, mm -mm -mm. Too fucking good. Anyway. Yep, that's gonna do it for Trade Talk. It's just, it's just fucking good. Uh, again, I'm gonna try to stay out of DC for a little bit, go through some independent and some other Marvel stuff. I picked up Grant Morrison's first volume of X Men. I'll see how I like that. I mean, it's Grant Morrison. I'm sure I'm gonna love it, but still. Anyway, that'll do it for this episode of Trade Talk. Everyone, thank you very much for watching. Uh, until next time, bye. And everyone, thank you so much for watching comic reviews. Uh, hope hope everyone had a good time. Oh wow, lots of comments on the um the Venom thing. Wow, got a lot of shit going on. Hold on. All right, let's see here. Uh, Tim or Damien? Damien, easily. Ian gonna read the Catwoman Bachelorette party issue? Uh, is that, is that part of the, the prelude to the wedding? Probably. I'll probably read anything that's leading up to that, because of how much I like that first issue. Um. <laughs> Venom v. Carnage, Dusk of Sony Pictures. Uh, that's pretty mean. Uh, you know, I hope the Venom film is good. Me too, but not putting Spider-Man in it, I just don't see how. Like, I've got a whole pitch for a great Venom movie, but or, or Venom story with Spider-Man, but, like, it's going to take four films to get to it. Uh, and that 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 mean, like, we'd have to start with the next Spider-Man movie. Um, and and I just, I just don't think you can do it. Um, uh, there's no reason they can't make a good Venom film, because a good Venom film already exists. It's called John Carpenter's... Christine do that but with an alien symbiote instead of a car and a journalist instead of a nerdy kid and you will have the best Venom film ever Sorry, this was around the time Marvel didn't know what the heck to do with Venom and, and Carnage I like this story just fine I thought it worked um, you know it's, it's whatever but man uh, yeah you're right on Christine that's that's a good point uh, and, and I think that's, yeah, that's how you do a Venom film. Uh, I'm talking about Venom specifically connected to Spider-Man, though. I don't think you can do it without Spider-Man there. Because you need the, the, um, scorned lover side of the, the symbiote for me. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. Uh, 
Venom works when he is written as a toxic ex-girlfriend, exactly, just like Christine. Uh, I prefer Venom as the Spider-Man who enforces others' great responsibility but is oblivious to his own. The inherent Ditko creepiness in Spider-Man turned up to 11. That's fair, too. I think you can have both. Uh, let's see. The art in Carnage USA is also really good. I might be tempted then because I really like the symbiotes. Uh, Eddie Brock is the guy who is in a delusional spiral of self-destruction, the guy who sees himself as a superhero even when he's just justifying his sickness and horrible behavior. Again, like the nerdy kid in Christine. Yeah, I agree. Uh, World's Finest is going to convince me that I'm wrong and that there's a better supervillain than Venom uh, for Spidey. I'll convince you easily. Two words, Ian. Big wheel. Don't know who that is. Didn't get the joke. Whoosh. Uh, I still feel anti-Venom and Toxin are just Marvel attempting to have a villain Venom and an anti-hero Venom at the same time. Probably. Yeah, I really don't like Venom being any kind of anti-hero or anything like that. God. They were on such a good kick at the beginning of that last Venom series, and then fucking dinosaur people happened, and I just it just... It's like watching a train derail, man. That is so unfortunate. All right, everyone. That's going to do it for comic reviews. Um, hope you enjoyed. Hope you had a good time here. Uh, until next time. Bye.